Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Transfigured. This is another episode in our Church Fathers series with Sam and Hank. Um, and today we are talking about Paul of Samosata. Uh, Paul of Samosata was the Bishop of Antioch, but was an extremely controversial figure whose career ended in disgrace. Um, and he is also probably the greatest, most prominent biblical Unitarian church father um, in history that we know about. Uh, but uh, like I said, it doesn't go well for him. Um, so before we get into that, um, I think next episode, we will be talking about St. Anthony of the Desert. St. Anthony is um, one of the first Christian monks who uh, is very famous for kind of starting a monastic movement and, uh, and kind of being a hero for monasticism for centuries and ages uh, of Christianity after that. Um, so lest anyone accuse us of only focusing on heretical people, uh, he is, uh, a, everyone recognizes him as a saint. So we'll take a detour into him. And then after that, we'll probably have to talk about Arius and um, Athanasius and Constantine and Eusebius and the, the beginning of the Arian controversy and the Council of Nicaea and all of that fun stuff. But we'll take a break. Uh, from Christo Christological controversies to focus on a nice uh, desert monk for a while. Um, so, uh, uh, so how are you doing, Hank? I'm doing wonderful. Are you excited to uh, talk about uh, my hero, my my own personal church father hero for a little bit? I'm actually just kind of kidding. I'm not entirely sure if he's my hero or not, but he does certainly seem to agree with me at the very least. Oh, he yeah. Or you agree with him? <laughs> I agree with him. Yeah. Um, so, but, but in all honesty, when I was preparing for this episode, so uh, historical information on Paul of Samosata is somewhat hard to come by. He was somewhat thrown down the memory hole um, by the later church history. Um, history is wit written by the victors, as they say, and he was not the victor. Um, but there's actually more information about him out there than I thought going into this. But I had to, there, so there was literally one of the best papers on Paul of Samosata was written by this obscure PhD thesis in at the University of Northwestern in like the 1970s. And so I literally had to like find this thing to get good information about Paul Samosata. So, uh, and I should also thank Rabbi Yosef, one of our regular listeners for uh, helping me get access to some materials that I didn't have access to either. So I had to dig deep into the archives to find good information about this guy. And honestly, I had kind of known ahead of time that some biblical Unitarians thought that he was sort of a forerunner of our theology. Um, but I, I figured that it, as I looked into him, he would seem less and less similar to me and perhaps, you know, have some similarities, but a lot of differences. But I was shocked at actually, A, how much we knew and B, how similar his theology was to mine. Um, I, I was uh, pleasantly surprised, I guess, by the similarities between contemporary biblical Unitarianism and the teachings of this Paul of Samosata guy. Um, so I guess to give some high level overviews, we don't know a ton about him, but he was born probably around the year 200 AD, which makes him about the exact same age as Novation, who we talked about last time, and uh, you know, 10, 15 years younger than Origen, who we talked about the time before that. Um, so he was born about the year 200, and presumably he was born in Samosata, uh, or at least was strongly associated with the location Samosata, and that's actually very important and relevant. So Samosata, is a town in what we would call southeastern Turkey now, but back then it was a sort of, it was in between basically the Roman Empire and um, the Persian Empire. It was in, you know, kind of the Middle East, uh, you know, near Mesopotamia. And it probably had a mix of cultural identity between being sort of Middle Eastern and being Greek. There was probably people there who spoke Greek, but the, probably the common language might have been some dialect of Aramaic. And so it had this mixed identity of being part of the Roman Empire, but kind of being on the fringes. And sometimes, you know, it was part of the Persian Empire. Sometimes it was part of neither. Sometimes it was part of the Roman Empire, right? So he's, he's not from Antioch. 
but he is kind of uh, from the Syrian hinterland, I guess you could say. Um, and, and I think that that will play an important part, uh, an important role in his story is that I think that he had a stronger association with his Syrian identity than with his Greco-Roman identity, even though he could kind of get along in both worlds, if that makes sense. Um, and so we don't really know how he became Bishop of Antioch or what his career was like that uh, led him to become Bishop of Antioch. But in 260 AD, he was appointed the Bishop of Antioch. And as far as we could tell, he was appointed lawfully by the normal process. It's not like he elbowed his way in there or there, there was any impropriety or anything like that in him becoming the Bishop of Antioch. As far as we can tell, he was appointed through the normal process. And so there, there are some reports, there's one report that's of dubious reliability, but it's possibly true that he lived in Alexandria for a while and was patronized by the same patron that Origen had that we mentioned a couple episodes ago. And it might have been the case that he had studied alongside Origen for a little bit, even though they have relatively different uh, Christologies and theologies. So he might have been I, I like to go from a, a not very important place like Samosata that was on the fringe of the empire and to become Bishop of Antioch. And as, as we've said before, Antioch is one of the most important cities in the eastern part of the Christian empire, in the eastern part of the empire. It's one of the most important cities in the Christian church, right? It's mentioned in the book of Acts. It's where Christians first become Christians. We've talked previously about Ignatius of Antioch, who was the Bishop of Antioch, you know, a little over 100 years before Paul of Samosata was. And so it, it's one of probably the three or four most important positions in the church. The Bishop of Antioch is important. The Bishop of Alexandria is important. The Bishop of Rome is important. Um, Ephesus is important. Constantinople doesn't exist yet. So that's not even really on the, on the table. So it's probably one of the three or four most important positions in the church. And one can maybe even argue close to the most important position in the church. So how a guy like him comes from the hinterlands, from a town that is not even really fully part of the Roman Empire, to become the Bishop of Antioch is an interesting question. He must have been a precocious dude. Um, Eusebius, who does not like him very much, we'll get into that later, says that he's from a poor family. Um, so how a guy from a poor family became, uh, because at, at this point in the empire, and this is also an important part of the story, is that most of the bishops and most of the high standing churchmen are also tend to be from the Greco-Roman aristocracy. They tend to be educated. They tend to be, you know, very fluent in Greek and literature and philosophy and those sorts of things. And that took a person from relatively high social status to have that background. So here's this guy, Paul, who doesn't have that background, um, but perhaps, you know, studied in Alexandria alongside Origen, or we don't even know really, comes to be the Bishop of Antioch. So that we don't really know much, but it, it, it's kind of a mystery. Um, that, and so he must have been a, a talented dude. Um, but another, another important ingredient of the history of this period is what's called the crisis of the third century. Um, the Roman Empire, we mainly associate the Roman Empire sort of falling in the fifth century to barbarians, right? Um, you know, people like Hank coming down from Germany and, you know, sacking Rome and that sort of thing. Um, but the empire almost fell apart in the third century. Um, there were, there was like a huge succession of emperors where every year or two there would be a new emperor. And basically it would be some general from the army who would extort the population to be made emperor. And then he would get a pile of money and then he would appoint some generals and then the generals would be like, well, why don't I just do the same thing that he did? I'll kill him and then I'll extort the population for money and then I'll get to be emperor. But you do that and then the next person behind you is ready to do the same thing to you. So the and there was also plagues and there was also um, incursions from the barbarians in the north and incursions from the Persians in the east. So the, the empire was at its weakest state that it had ever been since it had been founded in the mid third century. And so like, here's a little bit of a relevant timeline. 
in 260 AD, basically the same year that Paul Samosata gets appointed Bishop of Antioch, the Emperor Valerian is captured by Persian troops. He is the first ever Roman emperor to be captured and kidnapped by a foreign enemy. First time in history that that happens. And, you know, they, uh, I, that doesn't go well for him. I'll, I'll say that. And during this time, Rome is starting to lose control of its Eastern properties, um, including Syria. It's unclear exactly when they lose control of Syria, but that's probably because it was just sort of a messy, hazy, chaotic situation where no one was quite sure who was in charge. In um, 260 AD, after Valerian's killed, he's succeeded by a, name, a guy named Gallienus, and then Gallienus is emperor for about eight years, but then he gets assassinated as part of a conspiracy. He's succeeded by a guy named Claudius who dies of a plague in 270 AD. After a couple years of fighting, a guy named Aurelian takes over and he's emperor for a while and he retakes Syria in 272 AD. So there is this 12 year period from the defeat of the emperor Valerian by the Persians to the reconquering of Syria by Aurelian in 272 AD. And this is exactly the period where Paul of Samosata is Bishop of Antioch, which is in the province of Syria. The, the Antioch is currently in what we would call Southeastern Turkey, but back then it was you know, considered part of Syria. Uh, so part, so the, the reason why this is important to Paul's story is there is this chaotic situation where the Roman Empire seems to be de in decline and Syria is kind of up for grabs. So now we need to talk about who I think is one of the most interesting people in history. And there is this lady named Queen Zenobia. So in 260 AD, are around the same time that Syria is possibly, that Rome has possibly lost control of Syria, her husband becomes king of Palmyra. So Palmyra is a city kind of in the desert in Eastern Syria. Um, it's sort of a, along a prominent trade route between the Roman empire and the Persian empire. And it's sort of kind of like halfway in between. And so when Rome loses control of the city, her husband anoints, uh, appoints himself as king uh, because you know, there was political anarchy otherwise. And in 267 AD, her husband dies. And kind of after letting her son rule for a while, she eventually takes sole control of the monarchy as queen herself. And she's one of the only female absolute monarchs in this period of history, you know, uh, it, there weren't a lot of female emperors or female queens who were top dog in their kingdom at this period of time. And she's one of the few examples. So starting in about 267 AD, she takes full control of the kingdom of Palmyra. And she is actually quite successful at conquering a lot of land. And so she conquers basically what we would call Eastern Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, the Holy Land, Jordan, parts of Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. So, you know, what, a lot of what we would call the Middle East. She, she has is, a big chunk of land. So she has a big chunk of land. A big chunk of territory. And it's very wealthy. This is one of the most wealthy and important parts of the world. And, and it's because Rome is weak and Persia is weak. So it would be, it would almost like, and so... In 270 AD, her kingdom reaches its maximum extent, right, from Turkey to Egypt to Saudi Arabia. And then in 272 AD, this Roman emperor Aurelian retakes a lot of her territory. She's put on trial, she's publicly humiliated, but then she's brought to Rome as part of Aurelian's triumph. And then she's kind of allowed to live uh, as part of the Roman aristocracy until she dies a couple years later. But for five, 10 years, this kingdom is a, is a serious superpower in the vacuum of power left between the, fall, the weakened Roman Empire and the weakened Persian Empire. Um, so this is the context in which Paul of Samosata is the Bishop of Antioch. So remember, like I said earlier, he has this identity that kind of links him 
to Syria and kind of a, a low class, possibly uh, more Syrian identity as opposed to a Greco-Roman identity. And so what's interesting is in two, so he's appointed bishop in 260 AD. In 264 AD, a synod is gathered because basically Paul is teaching biblical Unitarianism, and this is rubbing some people wrong. And so there's a, a synod convened in Antioch with some of the bishops of the surrounding area and presbyters and other important churchmen from the surrounding area. And it's unclear if he was actually condemned at the synod or if he received a slap on the wrist or if they were unable to come to some sort of consensus about him being heretical or not. But in any case, he stays in power, but clearly the synod was gathered because enough people were worried that he was teaching heretical things to consider it worthwhile to call a synod. But nothing seems to come of this synod politically. In 270 AD, so uh, Queen Zenobia has taken over Antioch, and in 270 AD, um, Paul Samosata starts being patronized by the Queen Zenobia. So this is, I should say, it is the first time in Christian history that we know of where a bishop is receive, receiving state support from an empire. So Queen Zenobia, you know, she's trying to scrap together her new Middle Eastern kingdom. And one thing that she does is that she finds religious minorities that had previously been persecuted by either the Romans or the Persians, and she gives them freedom of religion and maybe even some state funding. And this is probably a political move to try and win up popular support for her empire by finding the people who are unhappy with their previous empires and making them happy in her own empire. And this includes giving state financial support to the Christian church, or at least the church of Antioch. Um, and this is, like I said, as far as we know, the first time in history where the church has received state support. Up until now, it's been persecuted either in the Roman Empire or even where it's expanded beyond the Roman Empire. It's at least not a state-supported religion. So, the, the, so this is interesting. And this kind of ruffles the feathers of the bishops that are still in the Roman Empire, right? So you can imagine that when Paul of Samosata decides that he's going to accept the patronage of the Queen Zenobia, that this looks like if you're the Bishop of Rome, or if you're in France or North Africa or some part that's still part of the Christian empire, you might be worried that this is going to make the Christians look like political enemies of Rome, even more than they already have that reputation if they are helping to shore up the popular support of this queen who's gobbling up uh, former Roman, temp uh, Roman territory in the eastern part of the empire. And so this, you could imagine, is probably seen as a political threat to the reputation of the Christians who are still loyal to the Roman empire. Anyway, I've been talking for a while. Uh, well, <laughs> and, and it's funny, Edward Gibbon writes about Paul of Samosata. And it's not very, it's not very um, beneficial, right? <laughs> Who's Edward Gibbon? You should. Uh... Edward Gibbon's a historian. Mm -hmm. and he says the wealth of the prelate was sufficient evidence of his guilt, since it was neither derived from in the inheritance of his fathers, nor acquired by the arts of honest industry. Mm -hmm. So obviously, it's probably pretty clear that Queen Zenobia was giving him some cash. Yeah. Right? But Paul considered the service of the church as a very lucrative profession. <laughs> okay, so you're seeing already that that's, you're seeing that that's the perception, right? Mm -hmm. Of, because he's getting, before, none of the bishops ever got any government help. They were always fending off the government. Right, and they, and they probably lived relatively close to poverty level. Right. And that they their only previous support was the financial support from their parishioners and the, and the church, which, you know, and it was probably seen as virtuous for them to live close to poverty and have a very simple life. Yeah, and, and something else that we'll talk about, he, he ends, he says, for Paul indulged himself very freely in the pleasures of the table, and he had received into the Episcopal palace two young and beautiful women, 
as a constant companions of his leisure moments. <laughs> So okay. this is part of uh, where we'll we'll have to wonder: Are all of these accusations true, or are these the false accusations of his enemies, or is there some amount of truth to them, but some amount of exaggeration to them? Yeah, just remember the Trinitarians lived in poverty; the biblical Unitarian lived in wealth and opulence. And I think that this actually is a big part of the contention, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, a hundred years after this, all of your Trinitarian bishops will be living in the same opulence that Paul is enjoying in 270 AD. A hundred uh, well, years is a long time. Yes. But this is the first time ever, right? Like I said, that a bishop is getting state financial support right. like this. And so I think that it um, ruffled the sensibilities of the, of the Christian world to see someone have, to see the church have that amount of financial resources and for the bishop to have a nice building, have a nice office, wear fancy vestments that, you know, set him apart and to enjoy the good standing of this Queen Zenobia where he can be one of the people in her court that gets listened to and that he's then able to, another thing that um, he gets accused of, and this is probably true, is that he was able to pay other clergy. So they accused, you know, the only reason why Paul Samosata is popular and why there's all these people that agree with him is that he gives them money. Well, you know, what that means is that he was getting money from the state and then he was paying his clergy, right? And, you know, this is something that will be the regular state of affairs for, you know, Christian history for a long time afterwards. But you can see for the Christian uh, uh, church that's still living in the empire under, well, so I should say during, during this time of uh, failure in the Roman Empire, there was actually a relatively few decades of peace from persecution because the Roman Empire didn't have the energy or the time or the resources to persecute the Christians, right? They were getting attacked by the Germans. They were getting attacked by the Persians. There was plagues, you know, no one had the time or energy to be persecuting the, uh, the Christians. So there was actually a couple decades of relative peace for the Christians during this relatively otherwise chaotic time for the empire. Um, but, you know, just because there's not persecution doesn't mean that you're doing very well either. So I think that it, Paul Samosata was conflicting with the habits and the tastes of the previous uh, couple centuries of the Christian church to be a small, not wealthy, simplistic living, communal, um, persecuted religion. And here he is finally enjoying some state largesse. And, um, and there was some jealousy and some envy, I think, because of that too. And I think that's part of the conflict. And so in 270 AD, they convene an even larger, probably the largest church synod in history up to this point is convened in Antioch. And the bishops come from Rome and Alexandria and, you know, all a lot, of, there's a big showing of the church that comes to Antioch in 270 AD. And there is a popular guy named Malchion, who is a well-educated sophist you know, we mainly use the word sophistry as an insult, but back then sophist meant that you were good at speaking in public. Um, so it wasn't necessarily an insult, but I'll just say the person who ex who, who uh, cross-examines Paul of Samosata is a sophist. So, uh, you know, make of that what you will. And what it says is that his heresy is finally revealed and that he is roundly excommunicated by the bishops of the synod. Go ahead, Hank. No. Yes. Origin is alive at this time, isn't he? Mm -mm. No, Origin is dead. Origin has passed away. Origin passed away in the 250s, and so this is 270 AD. So it's only it's only 10 or 15 years after his death. And this Malchion was probably a student of Origin. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of the bishops who are at the synod were uh, either students or influenced by Origin too, right? And so that so that's another part of this is. What I, I guess I would say the ascendancy of proto Trinitarianism mm -hmm. and the ascendancy of high Christology. Um, right, we read Novation last time, and Novation in the 250s AD writes a work that seems to be quite targeted at biblical Unitarianism as a heresy and talks about how, you know, they're outside the church and stuff like that. And that was only 15 years before the Synod. And 
you and I know that, you know, we, we've seen people who have kind of have a proto-Trinitarian theology for, you know, over 100 years before this. But in Justin Martyr's time, he talks about, hey, there are people who think that Jesus was just a, an exalted human. They're in my church. I disagree with them, but I get along with them, right? You know, there was coexistence in the time of Justin Martyr. But over the 100 years from Justin Martyr's time to Novation's time, it comes to be the case that this proto-Trinitarian theology is seen not only as what Justin Martyr thinks is right, but he can tolerate other points of view, to other points of view are not tolerated. And this is the capital O Orthodox teaching of the church, right? So that's another part of this story, especially in the well-educated Greek-speaking centers of the church, this proto-Trinitarian theology has become ascendant and dominant and seen not only as a version of the truth, but the only acceptable version of the truth. Um, and so that's part of the another piece of this story. But what's interesting is that um, it's quite possible that this proto-Trinitarianism was mainly common in the Greek-speaking areas of the church and was not as common in the Syriac speaking or the Aramaic speaking parts of the church where Paul Samosata had come from. So what I think is probably true, and we'll, we, we're, we'll make, we're, we've been mainly talking about the history. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll read some quotes from Paul Samosata and his accusers relatively soon so you can get a fuller sense of his theology. But what seems to be the case is that Paul is representing an older form of Christology that I would say is the original Christology of the apostles that had been hanging out in Syria and not as influenced by this growing form of Trinitarianism in the Greek speaking world. And that there's sort of this clash between the older form in, represented by him representing the Syrian uh, theology and the bishops that are condemning him representing the Greco-Roman theology. And that that's part of what's going on in this clash. So there's the synod in 270 AD where he gets excommunicated, but he says, so what? I'm not leaving. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? And, you know, to be fair to him, he's the Bishop of Antioch. He, you know, previously in the church, there was no higher level or rank than bishop. There was no one above a bishop, especially in an important city like Antioch. So what's happening is they're trying to make, the, they, the Greco-Roman church, is trying to make an authority that's above an individual bishop, and that is a synod or a gathering of many bishops, right? And this is important for the trajectory of church councils later on, because previously there was no one higher than a bishop, but now there is an idea that a church council of many bishops can make judgments on individual bishops, even very important bishops. But Paul Samosata kind of has a point because in Christian tradition, there's no one more important than a bishop. So how can you excommunicate a bishop? That's an oxymoron, you know? How can you excommunicate a pope, right? You know, the, 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 he is at the highest level of the hierarchy in his mind. So there is no council that has authority over him. Meanwhile, the other people in the council are trying to pull together the, the political authority to do this. I want to stop here and say, I think the best case that I can give Paul Samosata, not talking about his theology right now, about his judgment is it's not very good. Okay, <laughs> so let me let me explain why based on the history. Right, one by taking Queen Zenobia's uh, patronage, he had to know he was creating a problem. Okay, he. Had, he he had to know, okay? Yeah, yeah. Number two is he didn't come out as a clear rube from the, from shall we say, from the East. He had probably interacted with Origen and other theologians who are Trinitarians. Mm. He probably knew at least where he was going to as bishop that was going to cause a problem. Mm. Okay? He, so he, he has, in my sense, he has two issues that one he created and one we'll just say is there. He created the problem by saying, I'm going to take the patronage of Queen Zenobia. Okay. Um, think about that. He, I would almost say he's like Joel Osteen. <laughs> you know, there, 
the, there is a little bit of a prosperity gospel flair to him that we'll, we'll come to later that uh, it's untrue if, if that was a, a valid criticism of him or not. But I go ahead, make this comparison more. I think you, you might actually be kind of right. All right. So it, it, as I'm thinking about it, what you're doing is if you look at the church, right, the church basically is if you become a Christian, you aren't going to do very well. And the higher you move up in the Christian hierarchy, probably the worse you're going to do, including martyrdom. Yeah, you're, the, the bishops were an extreme, at extreme risk of being targeted anytime there was a persecution. Right, because because they they were, were, yeah. If you're a Roman or a Persian, you cut off the head. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So now you have this guy who's living in, you know, as I would give us that opulence. Mm hmm you know, he's, he's large and in charge. Yeah. And, oh, by the way, I'm a non-Trinitarian. Yeah. So which, he, which, which must have been an acceptable enough position for him to have been appointed bishop at all, right? That, that would be part of my point is that he did get elected bishop fairly. So that must have been still within the Overton window of acceptability. But right. I think during his career, and partially because of his career, yes. the Overton window gets shifted to cut him outside of it. Right. Yeah, I mean, the idea, again, he, he, you know, he, he, he also has, and we could discuss this more, let's say at the best case scenario, those women that were living with him were virgins. Mm -hmm. Which is, that, that is actually what Eusebius says. He right. says that he was living with virgins, um, right. which for the record, there were in Africa and in other places, the, the Christian world did have this practice where celibate monks and celibate nuns lived together, um, probably because they couldn't afford to have separate places for them. But it certainly looked questionable to the outside yes. world. And right. one could certainly imagine all the temptation that that uh, situation. Provided. Especially at a wealthy. This isn't a poor. Yeah. You do have the money that you could separate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the point is that the lifestyle beggars the other issue. Yeah. Okay. It, once you got the lifestyle right, now what you have is you have people looking to take you down. Yeah. So I mean, so, yes. so let me defend Paul a little bit. So Wait. here's what I think. Yeah, some more to do. I, here's what I think is going through his head. Mm -hmm. The Roman Empire has been persecuting us for centuries. They hate us. This is never going to change. Right. But hey, they're in decline. They're a power on in decline. There is this new opportunity presented by Queen Zenobia for us to no longer be persecuted and for us to be a part integrated into the empire and to be one of the free religions that gets state financial support. So, hey, let's jump on that bandwagon. Let's take it. That this could be the future of the Christian church is to live in the, the peace of this new uh, Palmyrene empire in the Middle East. And wow, how great is that? You know, in the same way that the Christians were super excited about Constantine a couple decades from now for the opportunity to be one of the state recognized religions and to not need to fear persecution anymore and to get state money, he is sort of the first to be like, hey, we have this opportunity. Let's support Queen Zenobia. Let's jump on her bandwagon. Let's bet on her horse because this could be a new great future for the Christian church. I think that's probably what he was thinking, but right. he bet on the wrong horse. <laughs> yes, he did, because then, as, as history has shown, Aurelian came in mm -hmm. with the, with the uh, prompting of the bishop from, uh, bishops from Italy and Rome and deposed. So there's. Amazon, and then there was what they called the little piece, 40 years that Aurelian basically said, don't persecute the Christians. So. Let me comment on that. So in 270 AD, right, there's this big synod in Antioch that excommunicates him, but he refuses to give in. And he, it's also true that he, uh, Eusebius admits this, that he has a lot of popular support, especially among the common folk. He was seemingly something of a populist. And this is why I think the Joel Olstein comparison is actually kind of a little bit true, yeah. is that 
part of it is that, you know, Paul wasn't a Greco-Roman aristocrat, right? Mm -hmm. He, uh, he was a Syrian by ethnicity, probably by native language, although he was certainly competent in the Greek language. But he, I think, sided with the lower class and that the lower class sided with him because he wasn't this aloof Greco-Roman aristocrat and that there was a lot of the Aramaic speaking part of the church in Antioch and in the hinterlands around Antioch that viewed him as one of them and on their side. And, you know, in a weird sort of way, when you're a populist, they the lower class likes often a leader that is on their side that is very flamboyant with their wealth, right? You know, like Donald Trump, for instance, right? He's a populist and is kind of considered popular among the lower classes, but yet he has, you know, his opulent New York, you know, Mar-a-Lago yeah. lifestyle because the lower class likes a powerful person that's on their side and, you know, there's sort of that weird sort of thing. And Joel Olstein and a lot of prosperity gospel preacher, preachers, they fly around in their private jets, but their main audience is actually somewhat lowbrow, right? There is that that sort of dynamic that that happens. So, so I, you know what, maybe if the, if someone could do an icon of Paul of Samosata, he'd have a red hat on saying, make Antioch great again. Yeah, <laughs> make, make Syria great again. Make yeah. Syria Syrian again, yeah. you know, and liberate it from this Roman oppression, oh, right? That Because I mean, that might have been part of it was this, yeah. this native Syrian identity right. that liked the fact that there was this Syrian queen ruling from Syria that was no longer, that was now liberated from Rome. And there was maybe even sort of this liberationist ethnic populism kind of thing that was well, going on too. Yeah, and as we discussed with Origen, Origen had... Or just seemed to be apart from the day-to-day -day Christians. And was kind of condescending and elitist. Right. And yeah. people may not be as smart as you, but they know when you don't like them or when you're condescending to them. And so if this rich guy in this big temple mm -hmm. treats you as, as someone equal, and is kind of and, and shares your identity, right? And is right. from the lower class like you, yeah. from your you, ethnicity you, 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 like you. You're gonna say, yeah. hey, why would you want to depose him? He's he's our guy. Right, right. Okay. So so when this aristocratic Greco-Roman synod comes to Antioch to try and depose him, he's like, What are you gonna do? You know, good luck. You know, the people are on my side, Queen Zenobia is on my side. So what if you maybe actually... January 6th that they try to depose him? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. And so he says, you have no power. You can't get rid of me, right? Okay. Basically, I'm the Bishop of Antioch. I don't care what your synod says. You know, you don't have, you can't, you, you have bark, but you have no bite. I'm not leaving, right? right? So then two years later, about two years after the synod, the dates are a little bit fuzzy, but the synod seems to have been in about 270. And then in about 272, the emperor Aurelian reconquers Syria and, you know, takes Queen Zenobia captive and sends her to Rome, right? And so in an episode that I think is just absolutely fascinating, the Bishop of Rome asks Aurelian to use his military to depose Paul of Samosata. So this is the first time in history that a bishop has asked the Roman military to do something for them, and the Roman military does it. So they go to Antioch, and they, so what's interesting is in 272, um, uh, the uh, Paul of Samosata is removed from his post, and he is replaced by his predecessor's son, so he he had been, so Paul had become bishop in 260. The person who died in 260 that Paul replaced, his son then replaces him. And you might say, how do bishops have sons? I thought bishops were celibate. Well, they weren't always back then. Oh. It was admired for bishops to be celibate, but they could also have families and children at well, that point in time. So it, it's clear that Paul really ticked off a lot of the bishops. Yes. To, to get a bishop to say, you know, go to the Roman emperor and say, hey, can you do me a solid? Yeah. And, and, and get rid of this guy. And, and what's more amazing is that the, the, the Roman emperor actually got in the middle of an ecclesiastical disagreement. Yeah. And you could imagine his motivation for doing so would be it was part of reconquering the territory. 
Okay, I'm take, I'm getting rid of Queen Zenobia and I'm bringing Syria back under my control. Okay, the Syrian church is kind of rebelling against me. I'm going to put someone that the, the Roman bishop likes and put it in charge. And that right. will sort of be a way of bringing the Christian population back under my control. And, so and, you could imagine that being his motivation for why. And, and that, that then created a 40 year peace between the Roman Empire and the church. I, I don't think it was quite that long because the the. Uh, persecution of Diocletian, which is one of the most severe persecutions that the church ever endures, is in like the 290s and early 300s, and that's only 25, 30 years later. So, okay, yeah. Um, but we'll we'll get to the Diocletian persecution later because that creates the Donatist controversy and a whole bunch of other things. But in any case, there is a peace for a while, and so. How, how do you feel about uh, the, the Roman church uh, using some centurions to go remove a uh, properly elected bishop from his post? Well, you know, if we read Paul in Romans uh, 14, right, you know, and 13, talking about honoring the uh, authorities, <laughs> just using the God-ordained authorities to do the things that God ordained. But I, mean, I, what... I, I do want to put a flag in this. It is pretty amazing that this empire that has persecuted the church on and off for over 200 years at this point, and this church that more or less fears the empire, would then suddenly get along well enough to for the church to ask the emperor to use his military force to depose a recalcitrant bishop is a pretty amazing, is, it's the first event of its kind yes. in, in Christian history. I, I think you'd have to look and say, one, you had an emperor who's trying to consolidate power. Yeah. Yep. And you have a bishop that seems to have know his his way around the politics of Rome. Yeah. Okay. This wasn't some kind of theologian um, at all. This we see this in the church, right? Some 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 bishops are 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 mystics. Some bishops are theologians, and some bishops are just thoroughgoing politicians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would assume that the bishop of Rome was probably the latter. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He, he you know, um, so yes, that, I find that very interesting and um, somewhat uh, disturbing in the sense that it, I think it creates a, a, a the, the church should not be using outside powers to enforce church discipline. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting that this is the first example of it. Um, that I that I'm aware of. Um, and as for the fate of Paul of Samosata after the Roman troops come in and remove him from power, we never hear about him again. Did he go into exile somewhere? Did he ride off quietly into the night, or was he killed by these Roman troops? Which I think is a decent possibility. We don't know, but it would be something if he were actually killed by these troops or executed um, for uh, for this, and that he was basically executed on the request of other fellow Christians. But we don't know if he was executed. But the fact that we never hear about him again suggests something happened. We don't know what. Well, I want you to. Um, I think that one could infer pretty strongly that he was killed. Yeah, yeah. Because the, the Romans didn't fool around, and, and I'm sure they were not happy with the idea that you went all in with Queen Zenobia. And a lot of the other officials and magistrates from Queen Zenobia's court were killed too, so. Yeah, would... I, I would expect that he would. He was probably mm -hmm. put to death. Yeah. And so he made a bet and he lost, both, he... both politically and I would contend, but we can now go into his theology. Yeah. And so I, I think that there are kind of three things going on, right? He has a different theology. He has a minority theology that's increasingly coming under suspicion, right? Even though I think it's the older theology and the original theology, it's running, it's coming out of fashion. And so that's part of it. There's the whole political thing with Zenobia, right, and the Roman Empire that's getting him in trouble. And then there is this sort of ethnic Syrian versus ethnic Greco-Roman thing that I think is also going on. And then there's also this kind of lower class versus upper class thing 
going on and he's sort of a champion of the lower class but that's also kind of the same thing as the ethnic syrians versus the greco-roman aristocratic elite so so it's all of those things so was he deposed because he supported queen zenobia or was he deposed because he was a biblical unitarian or was he deposed because he was a populist you know it's kind of like all of those things are are working together at the same time well i think if you take the aurelian's position he was Suppose clearly because he was in the in, in consort with Queen Zenobia. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that I'm, you know, I want I'm getting rid of, you know, I'm getting rid of all my enemies. They're gone. I mean, you know, yeah. the, a simple hardcore fact of politics is politics is to reward your friends and punish your enemies. Mm -hmm. And the, the Roman emperor knew that probably as well as anyone. I'm getting rid of them because if I leave them there, one, I'm creating doubt within my own within my own people of strength and power and intelligence and two is i've got this guy over here in a big city that has a lot of influence that can make mm. my life miserable he's out of here no okay and and it's it's interesting to ask is do, does the fate of paula samosata forever tarnish this theological position hereafter right and i think that the question is probably obviously yes right was he would he have been removed from his position on purely theological grounds if we ignored the whole political situation maybe maybe not because there was a synod you know a few years earlier before queen zenobia came to power that right. did not remove him so clearly there was people unhappy with him but there also must have been enough people happy with him where the synod maybe came to a couldn't couldn't come to a final resolution to get rid of him so it could have been that this theological position might not have gotten tarnished had it not been for the Queen Zenobia versus the Roman Empire business. But because of that business, this position is forever after an excommunicable offense, right? Uh, because of its uh, affiliation with Paul Samosata. Although Paul Samosata won't be the last bishop to hold this theology. Well, the, we, we'll have to wait another 100 years for the last person who holds this theology, even after the councils of Nicaea, which I think people don't quite get, but there were, there were still bishops who held to this theology for about another 100 years before it finally kind of gets its final nail in its coffin. Um, and then you all went to ground. And then we went underground until the glorious Protestant Reformation, where we have reappeared to harass you guys ever since. Um, so anyway, Which we is don't. Another reason why the Protestant Reformation is a destructive force. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have any of Paul's own writings um, for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. but we have him quoted a lot by other people that condemn him. Right. So we have a about a you know a microsoft word single page worth of quotes from him on the lips of his contemporaries accusing him and saying here's what he believed and here's why it's wrong right so i'll go through a couple quotes um, to kind of get the general idea so these are all quotes from paula samosata with some reasonable degree of historical reliability two gods would be proclaimed if the son of god is proclaimed god Jesus was not before Mary, but received from her the origin of his being. According to the promise, Jesus is a great and elect prophet, becoming both mediator and lawgiver of a better covenant. Christ is a man favored in a singular fashion by divine grace. Christ did wonders according to grace. Having been anointed by the Holy Spirit, he was named Christ at his baptism. With moral advance and trial, Christ achieved excellence. The Lord, Christ, was divinized. That, and the Greek word there is apotheosis, right? Basically, to become divine. Apo you know, we sometimes say apotheosis. It's sort of like something reaching its full potential nowadays is somewhat how we use that word. But it basically means to become God or become divine. So, you know, he, the, Paul Samosata believes in the divinity of Christ, but it's an achieved divinity, right? at the end of his career, not like uh, an eternal divinity. Wisdom filled him in every way. The Logos dwelled in Jesus as in a temple. By keeping the divine will immovably, 
Jesus was assigned the name, the name which is above all, the name which was given freely to him as a prize of love. Our Savior has become holy and righteous, having conquered the sins of our forefathers by suffering and trial, by means of which he achieved excellence. He was joined to God, having held one and the same will and energy with God by means of his progress and good works, right? So there's some more quotes that we can get to in a second, but the general outline is Jesus does not pre-exist his birth in Mary, right? And there are even some quotes where he says that Jesus existed only in the foreknowledge of God, but not in reality before his birth in Mary, which is exactly what I was taught growing up. Like when I read that, I was like, holy smokes, this really is the same theology as me, that Jesus's preexistence is only in God's foreknowledge, but not an actual preexistence. And that he becomes Christ at his baptism when the Holy Spirit gets poured on him. And that he is a perfectly moral, good human being who um, gets exalted to the right hand of God. He gets his divinity through participation in God, as opposed to it being an essential divinity. And he is given the, the name of God by God. He doesn't have the name within himself from eternity I'm past. Gonna, I'm going to pick at one of Paul's teachings, right? Sure. The preexistence of Jesus, right? Yeah. Find it hard to understand then when when Jesus gets the Jews mad before Abraham I am. Yeah, well, we could talk about that passage. We don't have Paulo Samosata's take on that passage, but before, I'll just say I'll just hint that two sentences before that Jesus said that Abraham looked forward to my day. He saw it and was glad. So I think that he's talking about existing in the prophetic foreknowledge of Abraham and God at that point, but. Yeah, but, but he still says, before Abraham, I am. I'll just say, I see your point, and uh, we'll, we'll move back to, so how did, so what did Paul think about the logos, right? Because the obvious question is, okay, what about the gospel of John? What about the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh, and all that sort of thing? And it's pretty clear that Paul views the logos as God, the Father's, speaking activity and truth and reason right the logos is when god speaks right that's what the logos is it's not a separate hypostasis it's not a separate person it is a power or an activity of god the father and that it dwells in jesus the way that god dwells in a temple so in other words jesus is a human person who has the logos power of God inside him, but it's not a separate person. It's not the second person of the Trinity. And here's the most fascinating thing. So this is what I think is the most ironic thing about Paul Samosata of all. It's ironic that he's the first one to receive state support and he gets criticized for it, even though that happens to the Trinitarians in about 30 or 40 years. That's ironic. It's ironic that he is deposed by Roman military power at the behest of the Bishop of Rome. That's ironic. The most ironic thing is so when he is being cross-examined, so what is the word, what is the Holy Spirit, and how are these things related to God? He says that the word and the spirit are homoousius with God. And he is the first Christian in history to use the word homoousius in relation to the word and the spirit's connection to God. So if you know your future Christian history, at the Council of Nicaea, the word homoousius will come to be used as the way that God and his son are the same substance. Homoousius, homo means same in Greek. Ousius means essence or substance or stuff or something like that, right? So when Paul of Samosata is defending his version of the Trinity, more or less, he says that God's word and God's spirit are homoousius with him. And what he means is that they are not separate persons. They are part of the same unity, right? They are attributes of God, the Father, not separate persons distinct from God, the Father. But he uses the word homoousius to describe this. And for a couple decades, the word homoousius becomes forbidden because it was associated with Paul of Samosata. So then at the Council of Nicaea, 
when the Emperor Constantine says, oh, so the way that you guys are talking about God the Father and, and the Son, it sounds like you're saying they're homoousius. And this becomes part of the Nicene Creed, even though at the 270 Council that excommunicates Paul Samosata, he gets excommunicated for using precisely this word to mean almost the exact opposite thing that it will come to mean in the Nicene Creed. So he's yeah. the first person to use the most controversial word in the Nicene Creed to describe his own theology, which is just hilarious. But well, what's interesting is Constantine. That's a guy I think we got to have a long discussion about. We, we will have he, to have at least one episode about Constantine. Because he sees something in this conversation and says, okay, let's do this. Yeah. So but he, he doesn't know have, the history. He doesn't know the history of Paul of Samosata again. No. Can but he has for a, using that word. But he has a theological mindset of some sort. Yes, yes. Okay, because clearly, for most people, even most Christians, that would go right over their heads. Yeah. But it didn't go over his head, did it? No, Constantine was a very smart, very well-educated, very philosophically sophisticated person. I yeah. think there's, we'll, we'll talk about him more later, but I think there's sort of this bad reputation that he has of being sort of a meat-headed jock who is just at the council kind of listening and I don't think that's true at all. He was one of the smartest people. I think he was one of the highest IQ Roman emperors there ever was. And one of, was one of the most smartest, well-educated, philosophically sophisticated people at, alive at the time. So he knew what was going on. Yeah, he, he, he knew what was going on. And I think he's given a bad name a lot of times by Protestant Christians. Yeah. And yeah. I, think, I think inappropriately so. But it seemed to be the case that when Constantine and the other people who will support the use of the word homoousius in, at the Council of Nicaea, they seem to mean that the son has the same divinity as his father, mm -hmm. not that they're the same thing, right? Right. But Paul of Samosata uses the word homoousius to say that the Logos and Holy Spirit are not something other than God the Father. They're aspects of God the Father. He uses it basically to mean that God is Unitarian, right? And that the, the word, God's word and God's spirit are not distinct things. They're part of the unity of God, all, right? All, all Constantine did was improve the word. <laughs> yeah, well, so this, this is part of why this word will be so contentious in the decades between the Council of Nicaea and the decade and the Council of Constantinople is because it has this history associated with Paul of Samosata, which I think is just hilarious. It's just because because Athanasius becomes famous for defending this word, but this word was originally used by a biblical Unitarian to describe his own theology. Well, I mean, it's like I said, it, it, that's the argument, really, right? The crux of the argument between a biblical Unitarian and a Trinitarian like myself is we use the same word, but we have a different perspective meaning. or meaning to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, you know, instead of going and getting argumentative, what I would say is the Trinitarian theology is we always say three and one. Mm -hmm. You have to use that word then. Because mm -hmm. if, if you don't use that word, then you're saying three. Yeah. And not one. And once right. you do that, that, that sort of blows the game. And whereas for Paul, like I said, he said two gods would be proclaimed if the son of God is proclaimed God, right? So he clearly has this incentive to protect the monotheism, right? Right. Um, and that he thinks that the way that his opponents talk about the son of God makes him like a second god which is a phrase you know that we already know was being used at the time and he says no 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 you know that makes two gods and and we we have to have one god but he does think that jesus is divine in a sense he thinks that jesus has the divinity of god at work in him through participation right instead of jesus being essentially divine right it's it's an it's a participative divinity where God is in Jesus working to do things, right? And so he calls Jesus God in that sense of the word. And he does use the word God, or really, I guess it should maybe be better translated as divine to talk about Jesus, but he also uses it as something that um, he achieved, right? That, that Jesus reaches divinity 
seemingly kind of in either the crucifixion or the resurrection or kind of both of those two things together that Jesus through moral effort and moral obedience and moral perfection becomes God in full perfect participation. And I think that Paul Sabasad is reading John 8, 31 through 42, where Paul, where Jesus is having a, a you know, the, the, the Pharisees want to stone him. Mm -hmm. And he says, haven't you read your own scriptures where you are called gods? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Paul Sabasad sees that and says, Jesus is finally that he is, God he, that the Old he Testament is, was Yeah, about. he is the human who has reached the full potential of humanity. Right. And now we are to follow in his footsteps and receive that from him. Right. And, and, and so I want to give a fair reading. Yeah. In, in essence, okay. As, as, as much as I disagree, the fair reading is Paul of Sam Asad is looking at this. Yeah. Because that, I just read that. Um, uh, I just read that uh, um, reading today for Lent, right? And it's like, mm. oh, wow, Sam and I are going to be talking about this. Yeah. And, and uh, reading it, what what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees is, you haven't read your Bible. You haven't seen what God wants for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, because if you read your Bible, you would and understood what God wants for you. He wants you to be God, small. It's sm it's a lowercase. It's not an uppercase. It's a smaller lowercase. And Paul yeah. Samson sits and says, that's what Jesus was. Yeah, yeah. He was that. And and Paul Samson seems to talk about the Holy Spirit quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, that the, the, I think that for him, kind of the, the word being in Jesus and the Holy Spirit in being in Jesus mm -hmm. is kind of the same thing. Yeah, the word is a little bit distinct. It's one attribute of God and the Holy Spirit's another kind of attribute or power of God. But they're kind of like, in what sense is God in Jesus? Well, it's the Holy Spirit that's in Jesus. And he talks a lot about grace, which is the word um, charis, which actually is the same. It's the word that we get charismatic from, right? So charismatic Christianity is charismatic Christianity, right? right. And, and so the word charis means both grace, like a gift that gets given to you, but it also means that sort of power that comes through the Holy Spirit. And there are some descriptions of Paul of Sam and church where they clap and wave hands and stuff like that, which sounds, well, what does that sound like? It sounds like a charismatic church. So right. you could imagine this emphasis that Jesus is sort of divine through participation of the Holy Spirit in him, and that us as Christians follow in Jesus's footsteps and also receive the same grace that Jesus received. And that that could be associated with doing miracles and speaking in tongues and all that charismatic stuff. And there are some of the descriptions of his church practices sound like charismatic practices. So it sounds kind of like a this emphasis on the, the Holy Spirit being in Jesus also was, was part of his theology in his church in a way that would look to us maybe perhaps like a charismatic uh, Christian experience. I, I think, look, you know, to round out this conversation. Honestly, you know, now a few things. One is that Paul Paul has a pupil called Lucian who becomes very instrumental in the 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 mentoring of Arius. Mm -hmm. So you in essence, when we talk about apostolic fathers, you know, Saint John, Saint Polycarp, Saint Irenaeus, Novation, right? Mm -hmm. Now you have Paul of Samosata, Lucian of Antioch, and then Arius. Yeah. And the, I think we're, we're like I said, where Paul got hung up very badly was the, it was taking Queen Zenobia's uh, um, help. Yeah. Becoming, you know, uh, Although, like I said, there are perhaps understandable motivations why he might have thought that that oh, could have been a good th idea. There were short-term motivations, right? Yeah. I mean, hey, we've been persecuted. We're poor. We're destitute. Life's, life is very difficult. And she's Syrian like I am. Yeah. Yeah. And she comes to you and says, hey, how about if I give you this, you get this, you do this, you do that, right? And she's, then you teach your Christians to support my new empire. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, if, if I'm a Roman bishop, this guy's not only a heretic, 
This guy is unpatriotic. Yes. Yeah. And right. he's uncivilized, perhaps, too, right? Right. You know, we're we're Greco-Roman civilized people. He's a he's a barbarian from the lower class. Yeah. Absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. That's what you're seeing. Okay. Yeah. And so but what's interesting is that Paul also seems to take this kind of more primitive Christology, and he learns perhaps from Origen and other people all of this fancy Greek vocabulary and philosophy. But instead of converting to the Greek Christology, he uses their words to describe his childhood perhaps teaching, right? And this is something that I relate to a lot. I right. feel like when I'm having conversations with Trinitarians, I'm having to use a fancier vocabulary than I grew up being taught right. to describe what I was taught growing up. Because when I was taught this growing up, we use relatively simple words and simple ideas to get a simple idea across. But now I'm having to use words like energy and participation and substance and essence and, the, and generation and all of these things to kind of describe what I believe to people who are more used to using those words. And I think maybe I'm projecting, but uh, I think that Paul had to do something kind of similar. Yeah. You know, one thing that would be interesting to me is if somebody decided to take a, a, a strong look at the early Syriac church. Yeah, yeah. The problem is, is we don't know too much about it. But yeah. there is some evidence, like one of the people that Origen condemns for biblical Unitarianism was a bishop in what in like Eastern Jordan, right, which back then was basically part of the same world as Eastern Syria. And so there is some evidence that at this time, this theology of Paulus Samosata was relatively common, perhaps, in the Syrian speaking church. Yeah, and, and, and here's a question. Who is the apostle or the early church fathers that were informing the Syriac in, in, in that part of another, the Another interesting thing is that Paul Samosata loves quoting the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel or in the book of Acts. These uh -huh. seem to be his favorite books. And to this day, biblical Unitarians often love the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts the most, too, because it seems to be the clearest teaching of this theology. Yeah, you guys certainly so, don't like the book of John. You know, the book of John's a little more difficult for us, I have to admit. But the book of Acts is that that's our bread and butter, baby. You know, <laughs> you know, you know, as Paul would say, I'm poking at axioms right now. Yes. Um, yeah. So you, you, uh, trust me, you do that quite a bit anyway. So, you know, I say, how, how about this? I'll read a quote from St. Athanasius to kind of wrap this thing up a little okay. bit. So this is from Athanasius talking about Paul Samosata. Um, is Jesus Christ a man like other men or is he God appearing in the flesh? Is he an ordinary man like the rest? Then let him advance as a man. This, however, is the opinion of the Samosata scene that is Paul of Samosata, mm -hmm. which you Arians virtually entertain also, although in name you deny it because of men. But if he is God bearing flesh as he truly is, and the logos became flesh, and being God descended upon earth, what advance had he who existed equal with God? Or how did the son of uh, God, uh, how did the son increase being ever in the father? So this is the distinction, right? So Athanasius says, you know, he, God, the son of God is ever with the father and he condescends and becomes a man, but there is no improvement open for him because he's already God from eternity past, right? But Paul of Samosata says that he is a human who ascends to godlike status. And what Athanasius is saying is, you Arians, you're kind of in between these two situations. And you are flirting with Paul of Samosata's philosophy if you go too far in your direction. So you need to come back in my direction. And, and this, is, this is the distinction. And I actually think that, for the record, Athanasius is not mischaracterizing Paul of Samosata there. I think he is correctly char characterizing Paul of Samosata. And so th this, is, this is the difference. And, and it still rings true today. And here's another funny thing. I, with, with this class thing, right? Like, if you are origin, you view yourself as from a high class position and you condescend down to these common Christian folk to help them. But if you are Paul of Samosata, you're from the bottom and you work your way to the top, right? 
and you can see that the, the Christology is, is mapped. The Greek aristocrats like the condescending Jesus, who was God who comes down to the people. The Paul of San Masada likes Jesus, who is a man who moves up to higher status, right? And, and it matches their social, social situations quite well. Well, uh, this has been a very interesting discussion. And the history has been very helpful, for, I think, to everyone who listens to this. It's certainly helpful to me. Uh, mm -hmm. I think a, a great job, and uh, you know, um, this is this is where we're finally getting to the nub of Christology. Mm -hmm. You know, and the interesting discussions started with Paul Samosata, really. Yes, you have others like Tertullian and and Origen and Novation, but but really, it comes to a head in Paul of Samosata in a unique really way does. that it had it before, right? And some very interesting things happened to Paul Samosata that never has happened to any Christian bishop prior to that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Either things that he worked with or initiated, then things that happened to him. But yeah, very, very interesting. And uh, like I said, I'm more interested in the Syriac church, which I don't know, you know, we know very little about. Yeah. But I think obviously he had a lot of influence in the early, early church. Yeah, yeah. So uh, next time we'll move out of the land of heresy into um, uh, St. Anthony of the desert. But we'll still uh, be in the desert. We'll still be in the desert. And, you know, uh, I, I think that this is, this is an extremely important episode in the church that really sets the stage up for important things that will follow. And that I think this is a story that almost no one knows anything about. I think this is this will be the only video on YouTube that really explains this story in any detail. So um, I, I of course, have my own motivations for wanting to learn about this story, but I hope the, the audience enjoyed it too. Share, share it with your friends. Let's monetize Sam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll share it in my biblical Unitarian circles. They'll, uh, they'll get to see. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks.